Tonight on a KLFY special report, we look at the diverse lives of people in Acadiana, Louisiana, and the United States. Right now, a KLFY special presentation, honoring black history, mind, body, and soul. Hello and good evening. I'm Delford Jones. And I'm Darla Montgomery. Tonight, as we honor black history through the mind, body, and soul, we tell you the story behind the flying nun and how she helped orphans from New York find a home in Acadiana. We'll also look at the black codes in St. Landry Parish and tell you about the Opelousas massacre. Plus, we share the history behind a small church in Youngsville and tell you how Louisiana's culture is being showcased through art. But first, let's begin with The Flying Nun. Well, you may have watched or at least heard of the 1960s sitcom, The Flying Nun, starring Sally Field. What you may not know is during that time, there existed a real life nun with the same moniker. However, her air travels took her from New York to Louisiana and changed the lives of black orphan children who found loving homes, adoptive families, right here in Acadiana. They came with The Flying Nun. <laughs> Excuse me. As the Caucasian children came on the train, they were flown here to find a home with Sister Mary Patricia, who is the flying. Named so because she flew all over with precious cargo, forever changing the lives of orphan children who were mostly black and multicultural. It was during the same time the orphan train rolled around the country, placing white children. It was also during the civil rights era, a time proven difficult to place minority children. So Sister Mary Patricia headed south to Louisiana. The minority children were flown here. They came by plane to Lafayette. Sister Mary Patricia handpicked black families with strong Catholic backgrounds, eventually uniting some 50 or more children with their forever homes right here in Acadiana. I grew up in Lost Hill, Louisiana. I'm back at my home town living where, close to where I grew up. Mary was an orphan in New York at the Foundling Hospital that was founded in 1869 by three sisters of charity who wanted to save the lives of babies being abandoned on the streets of New York. It's been in that, that Josephite Harvest magazine tucked away in 1968. The story needs to be told of what their journey was to get here. So the story is very special to me. And when that was shared with me, I continued to be drawn to it, to find out more, to say that their story's never been told. Sandra provided a copy of the story of the Flying Nun that was published in the Josephite Harvest in 1968, a publication by Josephite priests who are dedicated to black evangelization working specifically among black Americans. A difficult time in the country, but the Flying Nun was not alone in her efforts. They have homes filled with love that she brought them to. And she, along with Father Barnett, made all that possible. Possible for children like Sandra's cousin Mary, who was abandoned in a church in New York. I was left in a church confessional. <laughs> So I really have no clue as to my background. But she did find a permanent home in Lawtel, a family and a life of love as did Lisa, who was adopted by another relative in Sandra's family. But searching for her past had a different outcome than Mary. You found a biological mother. Uh, okay. 19, I believe, or 2020, right at the stop, top of the pandemic, no, 20, 2019. Mm -hmm. um, they changed the laws so that the um, birth records were unsealed. And ultimately, I did receive my birth certificate, and there her name was, you know. She learned her mother was born in Trinidad, and her father's ancestry is there as well. But home for Lisa and Mary will always be in Acadiana. And their connection to Sandra? Some members of Sandra's biological family in Lawtel adopted Mary and Lisa, keeping it all in the family. Love. Love is what it's all about. And if we can share that, that's the main and most important thing here. Their story is so incredible. Sandra started searching for the flying nun in hopes of reuniting her adoptive cousins with Sister Mary Patricia. Sandra says she found her, but it was a year too late as she learned Sister Mary Patricia died in 2013. However, they all take comfort in knowing personally the lasting impact Sister Mary Patricia had on them, their community of Lawtel, and their families. 
Louisiana's 24th governor was the first African American governor in the United States. Pickney Benton Stewart Pitchback was the born in a person of color in 1837 in Georgia. Pitchback was the son of a white plantation owner and his former captive, who was of African, European, and Native American ancestry. He became the captain in the Union Army and ended up in New Orleans during the Civil War. Benchback got into politics and advocated for African American causes, including the creation of Southern University. He became a state senator. When Oscar Dunn, the first black lieutenant governor, died in office, Benchback served as the second highest executive office in Louisiana's government. He then became governor in December of 1872. Immediately after the Civil War in 1865, Reconstruction began. Louisiana would have the first black mayor, lieutenant governor, and governor in the country. But Reconstruction was also the beginning of a regression era of freedom for African Americans. Christopher Leach has the story. By December 6, 1865, the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery in the United States. The bloodiest war the country had faced was over, but racial conflict was to endure as former Confederates fought to reestablish themselves and radicals from the North tried to rally the formerly enslaved for their votes. But freedom was probationary. The Black Code was a way of keeping former slaves on the plantation, keeping them under control. Because of a fear that it might kind of lead to turmoil or kind of go against the, uh, a slave-based society. Black codes would restrict the recently emancipated shortly after they were freed. It would set the stage for different types of citizenship and challenge the very concepts of freedom and equality. Every county and parish in the South had black codes, and St. Landry's Parish had a curious one in particular that required its black citizens to work for someone who was white, restricted free travel without a permit, ordained that no blacks were permitted to rent or keep a house within the parish, and outlawed public meetings of blacks, among other restrictions. You're required to stay on a plantation that, that uh, enslave you. It's unfair. It's inhuman. By 1868, the tension had mounted with political election on the horizon. The two opposing political newspapers were writing of the dangers of an all-out race war. An editorial published by uh, an 18-year-old teacher named Emerson Bentley, who was originally from the North but had come down to Louisiana to teach in the Freedmen schools. He published accusing um, the white Democrats and former Confederates of intimidating blacks so that they couldn't, uh, so they couldn't register to vote, you know, or, or showing up in mass armed at political gatherings. Several days of violence ensued with higher estimates leaving over 200 people dead, mostly African-American citizens in Opelousas. Those who were arrested out of jail by the Ku Klux Klan and lynched. The progressive political party that sought to uh, enfranchise the black vote was completely destroyed um, a month before the election. Honoring Black History, Mind, Body, and Soul. I'm Christopher Leach. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 declared all people to be American citizens regardless of race. But it wasn't until about a hundred years later with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 when racial discrimination was prohibited. Coming up, there's much history behind this small Baptist church in Youngsville. But first, a folk artist makes 3D creations in order to showcase culture here in the Bayou State. Stay with us for more of our special presentation, honoring black history, mind, body, and soul. 